a brand new one. It's about a four-week series, and we're going to walk through, obviously, the book of Jonah. Uh, about once a year, uh, twice a year, I like to go through books of the Bible and just let God speak to us through those uh, and how... Uh, sometimes I think we read the Bible as kind of like we just read it, you know what I'm saying? We don't apply it. And so I like taking bib, the, the Bible, book for the Bible, I think last year we did the book of Ephesians, and walk through it and make it applicable for our life. And Jonah is no different, because Jonah, I believe this, every person, look at your neighbor and say, that's you. So you, you point at them, you can go, we can point at them, that's you. All right, some of y'all ain't playing along. Look to your neighbor, point at your neighbor. There, there you go. Praise God. Now everybody knows you weren't playing along. I'm just telling you that, okay? That's all of us have a little bit of Jonah inside each one of us. And when we talk about this message, you're going to see that. You're going to see areas that we're going to talk about that you go, snap, man, Pastor Mike read my mail, man. And that's right, I do that. I read mail very well. But it's not true because God speaks to me first. So if you have your Bibles with you, uh, open up to the, con the table of context that's in the front of your Bible and look for Jonah. Now, most of y'all have never read this book. You might have familiar with, you know, we kind of American story, the, the guy that got eaten by the whale, right? We kind of know the, 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 the little story there, but we really have not read the book of Jonah to the extent that we're going to do today. And so if you're thinking, man, you're here, and you're like, oh, snap, this preacher's going to get up there, and he's going to bore me. No, promise you, uh, I will not bore you, but I will wake you up if you fall asleep. I'm just putting that there. And we are live, so we can put you on camera as well. All right? So in the front of your Bible, you'll find a place. Jonah, go over there. It's about three-quarters of the way in the back of your Bible. You're going to see some like Star Wars names like Benajah and all these other crazy people. When you get to those little names, that's where you're going to be, Micah and Malachi and all those names. You're going to find Jonah in the back of that book. Jonah is a great book because the story of the Jonah is, of course, we've talked about the belly of the whale, but really it's a deeper message because the whole story of Jonah is the story that we all can relate to. And that's the story that all of us in our hearts, even though we won't admit it, have a little bit of rebellion in each one of us, right? Would anybody say, I got some rebellion in me, praise God? No, no nobody. <laughs> praise God, man. Some of y'all raised your hand. You are gutsier than I am, praise God, all right? Um, it's God's, really the book of Jonah, though, if you wanted to sum it up, it's God's relentless pursuit of his rebellious children. That's you and me, because he's still doing that today. He's still in the business of running after you, running after I mean, we think, man, that we're out of God's reach, but we're not. And in almost every one of our stories, the story of Jonah is actually not very far from who you are and who we are. And most of us have the same common problem. And the common problem is this. In some way or some form or some fashion, here's the problem. Y'all ready? God speaks and we run. Come on, somebody. I preach better when you pass and participate, right? God says do this, and what do we do? Oh, no, you weren't talking to me. You were talking about other people, praise God. You were talking about the Baptist folks down the street, right? Or the Methodist folks. And Cal you weren't talking to us. But it's an argument that we constantly have in our life. And here's what I'm going to tell you right now. Even before this message is over with, many of you in this room are going to hear from your Heavenly Father. And it's going to be a way that you wouldn't think that God would speak to you. It could be through this message. It could be through a song. It could be through the different activities that we're doing today. So let's, let's, let's look at it. Let's look at, let's just begin in Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. And I love it because it says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amadi, saying... Now I want to stop there for a moment. Because here's what's really interesting. Jonah was a prophet. What a prophet was back in that time is that uh, God didn't speak like He speaks today. So like today... Right? Because of the Holy Spirit, we all, every person, say every person. Say me. Say it louder. Me. You can hear from the Father. But back in the time when Jonah existed, that wasn't the case. So God would speak through one man called a prophet, and then the prophet would come and speak on behalf of God to the nation of Israel or to God's people. Okay, And that's where we're at today. So God is speaking to his people. Now the question is, and I've had this asked so many times, people say, well, Pastor Mike, well, is God speaking to you? Do you hear God? Yes, I hear God. And sometimes God sounds like a slurred speech, short dude. Okay, country, Texas, uneducated person. Sometimes he sounds like a pastor. Sometimes he talks like different ways, right? But he does speak. And a lot of times... It's every time I pick this thing up. 
is when I hear his voice the loudest. When I hear his voice the loudest. And so does God still speak? Yes, God still speaks. God continues to speak to his people. And oftentimes, it's not that God's not speaking. It's not that God's not even speaking to you. You might say, well, God has never spoke to me. But here's my pushback. is God is always speaking. Always. The problem is this. Is that we live in a world today that is very loud. We live in a culture that is very noisy. Would you agree with that? I mean, right now in my pocket, and some of you in your pocket, some of you all have them in your hand, we all have one of these. This has become the most distractive thing to any believer in Christ. But yet it's one of the greatest tools, right? It's one of the things that, man, we can go shopping on here. We can, we can get things done. We can check on our kids. We can find out where they're at. We can do all sorts of great stuff. But it's also one of the greatest things. But that's not the only noise that we hear. There's all sorts of noises right now, especially politically. Oh, my goodness. There's so much noise out there. And so here's the thing, is that will God, or is God, uh, the question is speaking to you, and I do, do believe that he is. He speaks uh, when our ears are tuned in to the Holy Spirit. He, he's speaking. He speaks through, like today, he speaks through sermons. He um, speaks through spiritual authorities like leaders and pastors and elders, and, and he speaks that way. He speaks through, like this morning, some of you already heard from the Father during the worship time. He speaks through worship. And sometimes he speaks through those little deep nudges that are down in your spirit. You know what I'm saying? You're, you're at a particular place and, and something inside you, something deep down inside you say, hey, you need to get out of here. Or you're driving a certain way that you take every day to work, but you wake up that morning and for whatever reason you feel a nudge in your spirit, way down in your soul that says, maybe you need to take a different route today. And you thought it was your idea. And then you find out later there was a massive traffic accident. Or maybe you're like a guy that woke up one morning, early, early in the morning, going to work like he normally does, and something in him told him to stay home with his family. And he, today he couldn't tell you what that was. But then around 9 or 10 o'clock in the morning, he turns on the news, and he sees two jetliners fly into a couple of towers. Now, why didn't God tell all of those 3,000 people that were destroyed? We don't know. But for this particular person, he heard something down in him and it caused him to make a different decision. So God is still speaking. The question isn't whether or not God is still speaking. The question or not really is, is, is he speaking to you? And when he does, here's the, here's the key element about this, is that it will always align with his word. And a lot of times when he's speaking in your life, it'll be confirmed, watch it, in, in our brothers and our sisters, the people who know us best. The people that are around us, man, there's something different about you, man. God's doing this, and hey, you know what? I've been praying for you, and this is what you should be doing. Or uh, They're not answering it, but they'll confirm. I've had people ask me, Pastor Mike, will you pray and hear God for me? I said, I can't do that. It's not my ability. I am not that guy. Now, I can confirm what God is speaking to you by wisdom and by what the Word says, and, and I can confirm that way, but I can't speak to God on your behalf. Rather, I can't hear for God on your behalf. You have to do that. But it's interesting. People say, will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? Will you pray for me? And we all do that. We all say, yeah, we're going to pray. And we end up praying for that person. But the, here's the thing. Generally speaking, and I'm not saying always, the person that's asking for prayer isn't praying themselves. And God wants to hear from all of his children. Not just the guy that's up here or girl that's up here. God wants to speak through all of us. And really the question isn't whether or not we can hear. The question really is, I would ask, and the red flag for me would be, why can't you hear? Now, I'm not talking to people that maybe don't have a relationship with Christ, okay? I'm not talking to you. And so if you're maybe here this morning, you're visiting the church, you're kind of checking this thing out, I'm not talking to you. You've got to kick back and relax for a minute, okay? But I am talking to those who call themselves believers. I am talking to those people who say, man, I follow Jesus. Jesus is my Lord and Savior. I go to church every Sunday. I sing the songs. I know the hymns. I know the scriptures. I know all this. But the question then is, are you hearing from him? Because if you don't, my question is, do you even know him? You might say, well, Pastor, that's not very politically correct. Well, let me show you what Jesus said. He wasn't a really polit political correct guy anyway. John 10, verse 3 and 4, it says, this is the one the gatekeeper admits. Now, the gatekeeper is Jesus. All right, this is out of the complete Jewish Bible. And the sheep hear his Voice. Who? The people that he allows in. He calls his own sheep, each one by name. And I need to pause for a minute. As I was reading this this morning, here's what just jumped out at me. 
I love the fact of what he says. He calls his own sheep and he calls them by name. This might be for you today. So like inside a message, there's like little messages. And so you might pick up on one of those little messages, right? And that might be for you today. That do you know that God knows your name? Not that you just exist like, okay, like in the United States, there's 3.5 billion people or whatever, right? Not that kind of way. But literally, he knows your name. He knows Mike. He knows everything about Mike. The good things about Mike. And even, yes, the bad things about Mike. He knows my name. What does that imply? It implies relationship. You see, God is not a God that's just sitting out there kind of waiting to beat you up with an ugly stick. Right? What he is, is he's, he's waiting for you to turn to him. And when you do, he says, you are mine. He becomes your shepherd. Now, verse 4 says this. After taking out all that are his own, that are walking through the gate with him, he goes on ahead of them. I love this. And the sheep follow him because what? They recognize his voice. See, that's the question. The question isn't whether is God speaking. The question really is, do you recognize his voice? Because he's talking. He's always, he's worse than Pastor Mike. You know, if you get around me, you ask me questions about the Bible, I'm going, but God's always talking. Always. I remember one time when I was a, uh, a few years back, I was on this amazing little journey. And uh, it was a quest, and some of y'all heard me say this story before, but part of this quest, I was with about 30 other men, and uh, one of the assignments was that morning, we had to go out on this 500-acre ranch. And we had to go find a place that was just for me and dad. And one of the things you had to do, first of all, is you walked out the gate, you stood at the gate, and you asked the Holy Spirit. I know this sounds weird, but this was the way we worked. It was, it was teaching us how to respond to the Holy Spirit. And I walked out there, and, and you're supposed to say, okay, Holy Spirit, where do you want me to go? And the first time you heard something, that nudge, you'd go that direction, left, right, forward, whatever it was, right? And so I got to this place that I felt like the Lord had led me. And on this journey, kind of walking this path, it was really cool because I'm a hunter. How many hunters we have in the room today? Praise God. I like to hunt, bow hunt, no hunters. Okay, we got a few of them. Praise God. All right. Uh, love to hunt. And so I'm always, I grew up in the woods. I, I mean, my stepdad, my father, they taught me how to walk in the woods. And you didn't just walk with, you know, yelling, screaming, hollering, you know, hey, you know, we walked quietly. My dad would always teach me that you take a few steps and you stop and you look around. You wait. Take a few steps, you stop, you wait, you listen. And we're listening for wildlife, we're looking for wildlife. So this is kind of ingrained in me uh, as, a, uh, as an adult. And so I was seeing deer and bucks and all sorts of wild animals because I was looking for them, it was really cool. So the Lord leads me to this little place, it's a hill, and so I get to sit back, kind of nudge back on this hill that's behind me, and I pull out my Bible, I got my backpack there, I start getting my journal out, I'm ready to hear from the Lord, and about this, and some of y'all go, who go in the woods, you'll know this, right? So you get out there, and just when your heart kind of settles down, right, and, and everything finally quiets down out there, and it's kind of eerie a little bit, you know, you're kind of like, you know you're by yourself. Right about that time, I hear, crunch, 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 yeah, you got talking, you know. And this dude comes from up the hill, because I'm leaning against the hill, he just comes storming down this hill, and he looks at me, and I kind of scared him. I'm like, dude, really? And he goes, man, have you seen any wildlife out here? And I said, man, they're all over the place. They're everywhere. He said, man, I can't see anything. And he's got a backpack on, and he's dragging it around. He's making all sorts of noise, and off he walks. I can literally hear this guy walking away. As he goes into another thicket, and he's way away from me. So I sit back against the hill, take a deep breath, starts, everything gets still again, right? And I hear it again. Here he comes. From where he came, he just walks right up, making all sorts of noise, breaking branches, talking from across the pasture. Hey! He's walking up to me, you know. Have you seen any wildlife? Out here? Are there sure there are deer out here? I said, they're all over the place, man. Man, I can't believe I haven't seen any. I'm like, me neither. He walks up the hill. He said, man, you got a really good spot. I said, I did. He finally walks off, and he gets lost, and he goes doing whatever he's doing. But after it finally settled down the third time, I hear the Holy Spirit say this to me. He said, do you know why he couldn't see any deer? And I'm thinking God's got this real deep, you know. Sometimes when God speaks, he sounds like you. All right. So I'm thinking he's going to have this big, deep spiritual truth. And so I said, no, Lord. I said, Why? And the Lord said, because he's not looking for it. He's making noise. He's just walking around. He said, he said son, it's, it's the same with me. He said, I'm always speaking to my people. The problem is my people are too busy to stop 
and to listen. So we find Jonah in this kind of similar place where he hears from God and God is going to give him an assignment, but he's got to listen and be very, very pay attention to what he's doing. In Jonah 1, verse 2 and 3, it says, Arise, here's the order that God gives them. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now this word go is the same word that Yeshua told his disciples. It is the same exact word where he said go and make disciples. This is the exact type of phrasing that God gives to Noah, to uh, Jonah, and telling him, go. We all have an assignment. Everyone in this room, you are not less than, you are not greater than. We all have an assignment that God, before the foundation of the world, is telling you, go. Salvation is not just about getting our life right with Jesus, which is important. I believe we've got to lay down our life and pick him up and go and follow him. But it's about how God has created you to impact the kingdom of God. Every person in here. We might say, well, Pastor Mike, I'm not educated enough. doesn't matter. doesn't matter. It might be, you say, uh, I don't know the Bible enough. It doesn't matter. I'm not filled with the Spirit enough. It doesn't matter. Every person in here who has a pulse that God has drawn in by His grace and His mercy, you are called to something greater than yourself. Something greater than your world. And Jonah knew this. And in verse 3, he says, Arise, go there. In verse 3, he says, But Jonah arose. Now watch this. Here's where we're all at. What did he do? He flees to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. Man, there is a message right there about the times when you run from God and the things you'll pay. And he went down into it to go to them in Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He's running. Now here's the interesting thing is that Nineveh uh, was the capital of Assyrian Empire. Now, that might not mean anything to you when you think of Syrians, you're like, who are they? These were like, these were warlords. They loved Nineveh because Nineveh is about the northern peak to kind of bring it home to us today. They're at the northern peak of Iraq. So think about in your head, you know, all the stuff that's been going on over there in the desert, man. This is the same instance. This is the same place. About the northern peak of Iraq, you'll find this place. You'll find this, uh, this place, Nineveh. And Nineveh was so powerful is that everywhere they went, they were the, they were the uh, let's just say they were the starters of what real terrorism looked like. Matter of fact, the, the rumors are, and some of the historians say that, that they had a way of creating fear in people to make them, like they wouldn't even fight them. They would just know of their reputation. And it was so great that they would just, they would just give up. They would literally capitate people and put them on stakes and, and march into the other cities with these, the, the, the kings and the foreign leaders of the other country, uh, cities into these cities to post them up just to get them to say, we give up. We, we don't want that to happen to us. Sound familiar? A little bit. So he runs. He flees. He doesn't just flee. He runs. The, the Bible frames Nineveh as thoroughly an evil city. But interesting enough, God wants them. What's that tell us? God cared about them. God has a love for them, just like the people that you're around that you can't stand. Maybe people that aren't even in our, in our borders. That God says, I still love them. And somebody has to go to them. And somebody needs to introduce them and tell them to repent and tell them to come back to my ways of life. Now, what does he do? Man, this is interesting. It's, so let me kind of get, paint a better picture. So what, what Jonah is being asked to do is to go into Nineveh and tell these people who hate Hate Israelites. He's an Israelite, okay? He's a prophet. Hate them. It would be like us, God speaking to you today to say, okay, I want you to get up, leave today, go to Afghanistan, and tell the Taliban to repent. That's what's being told here. Now, we already know, if you don't know this, our brothers and sisters in Christ, men, are under a huge persecution right now in Afghanistan. And this, is the, this, this could not be a better fitting scripture for right now. Because that's where we're at, man. That's what's going on. God's speaking to his people. So what does he do? Rather than on the earth, it's 500 miles from Nineveh, or from where Jonah is to, to Nineveh. 500 miles. What does he do? He doesn't just go 500 miles. He turns and goes the other way. 2,500 miles. That's running, baby. 
That's getting out. That's booking. It's like, I'm getting away from this situation. I'm getting away. Uh, I'm going to try to hide from God. I'm going to run from God. But here's something we can get from this. And I want you to get this in your spirit. God never, say never. God rarely, never, or ever will call us to something that's comfortable. Write that down. God rarely calls us to comfortable. Now, we'll pay for comfortable. Come on, somebody. Right? Desert heat. Or uh, Texas desert heat. Texas heat. We're going to pay for an AC unit against all. Come on, somebody. We will do whatever needs to be done to make sure we have AC. I don't care how many 50 windows you have. You'll have 50 window units in your house. Uh, you can hang meat, right, in your living room while you're watching your Xbox. Come on, somebody, right? We will pay for comfort. But God will not provide comfort most times when he calls you to do something. We don't understand that. We think that God wants to call us, call us into something that will make us feel good, that makes us happy. Not all the time. Man, I remember when I was called into ministry, I was, I was like, no. I did not want the care and the responsibility of someone's soul on my hand. And if the Lord had showed me, see, let me tell you something. This is a big secret for all of y'all. See this beautiful, beautiful beard? It used to be dark. It used to be such a beautiful, beautiful black color. It was beautiful. Yeah. And I became a pastor. This is your fault. Every one of y'all, it's your fault, okay? This was beautiful. I mean, b beautiful, brother, okay? I mean, not gorgeous. I have pictures to prove it. Unedited pictures, by the way. Yeah. God doesn't call us to comfortable. Jonah, being a prophet, would know this. He would not only know that God wouldn't call him to something comfortable, he would know that God, man, you can't run from God. I don't care if it's 2,500 miles, 500 miles, a million miles. You can't outrun God. This is a dude that's a prophet. He would have known what the book of Psalms said in 139, verse 7 through 12. He would have said this. He said, where can I go from your spirit? This is David. Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, but even the night shall be as light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not be able to hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. Jonah would have known this. He was a prophet of God. He knew this. This wasn't a big secret. We do the same thing. We think, man, if I can run fast enough, I can run hard enough, right? Right? So you got to get this into perspective. I mean, God's got, it's like God's calling him to, uh, what, Port Arthur? And he runs up to Alaska. Now, some of us are like, hey, Alaska, that's not a bad idea, praise God, right? But that's the difference. See, this is not about big brother watching you. This isn't about God has hand over you and he's waiting for you to kind of jack something up. No. It's that you have purpose. And he knows everything about you. And it's about a loving creator that looks out for his creation. Robin and I uh, garden a little bit. We're, we're getting better. She's way better than I am. And uh, when we moved to our new home, we set up some planter boxes. And at the other house that we were at, we had, um, we had planted the garland early in the season, but we, were, uh, we had to move. And so when we moved, we picked them all up. We put them in buckets, right? And then we brought them out to our new house. And once we got our things situated, Robin planted them in our, in our, little, our little garden boxes. And uh, what I love about that is that you can ask Robin anything right now without her even being at the house about that garden. And she can tell you every bit about it. She can tell you what kind of soil it is in. She can tell you how she, how she started the soil. She can tell you what plants are in there. And she can even tell you what plants that are in there right now that have fruit on the vine ready for the picking. You know why? Because she created it. And you know that God has the same view of you he has created you. He knows everything about you. And let me tell you something. Maybe you're struggling with this. You know, even the things that you think you're hiding from the Father, He already knows about it. He really does. He knows everything about you. The struggles that you're having, the, mis uh, the misgivings that you're having, the doubts and fears that you have, and even the, what's the causing the addictions. And for you to run in the complete opposite direction god knows everything about you it's just dumb really i mean can i just be plain for a minute it's just dumb to think for a moment that we can outrun the father but we do it every day many in this room and even yours truly have been in that place 
Because see, God knows all and he sees all and he still loves you. He chooses. Isn't that amazing? Think about that for a moment, all right? I want you to, I want you to, everybody in this room, online, watch this. Do this for me, all right? Will you play along? Close your eyes for a minute, all right? Look in the mirror. Close your eyes and look at yourself. And I'm not talking about just your, your gorgeous self when you're going to like out to the club or going to a wedding or you really fixed yourself up that day, right? I don't, want to, I don't want that person. Look at the person that nobody knows about. The person that's hiding the stuff that nobody else can see. Daddy sees that person. Now look at me. He loves him. He loves you without the makeup on, ladies. Okay, I know. Guys, you don't have to shave. Even if you are frolically challenged and you can't do this, he loves you. He does. He, oh, bro, I'll pray for you, bro. That was wrong, man. That was like, wow, praise God. We're going to pray for, pray for our leadership. But it's dumb. See, he knows all, he sees all. Jeremiah 23, 23 through 4 says it like this. Am I a God near at hand? In other words, right, what this means is like all I can see is what's close up to me says the Lord or Adonai, and not God afar off. See, if you're afar off, you've got a bigger picture, right? You get to see everything, right? Can anyone hide himself in secret places so I shall not see him? Didn't you think Jonah knew this? Says the Lord, do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? We're talking about the God who created everything, knows your name. We're talking about the God who created everything, knows all the good and the not so good in your life and yet he still says if you'll call unto me i'll run it's the story of the prodigal father standing on the hill waiting for his son or daughter to come through the gate so he can run after him god loves you he does and Jonah had to know this because he was a prophet of god in john 15 i want you to read that on your own it's a great passage of scripture Read that alone. But he promises that if you'll abide in me, and I'll abide in you, draw close to me, and I'll draw close to you. And even in John 15, he tells us how that's possible. How we can know him even more than you know him now. And he says by two ways. Number one, that we pay attention to his word. See, as you read the Bible, it's not about like being religion and go, I'm going to read, I'm going to do my religion. No, it's about drawing near to the Father. And it's a paying attention to his will for your life. I think sometimes we get caught up on the reversal, don't we? We're always busy about everybody else's life, right? You know when we stand before the Father, he's not going to ask you about me. I know, isn't that crazy? Or your neighbor. He's going to ask about you. Did you hear his voice? Did you respond to that voice? Did you walk according to that voice? Amen? Come on, y'all. These both will draw you closer, but the opposite is also true, right? The opposite is also true, that if, uh, when, when we ignore his word and we ignore his will, the sad truth of it is, he will ignore us. But here's the question. Let's get back to Noah. Have you ever noticed, and maybe it's just me, but have you ever noticed that when the Father calls you to go in one direction, there is usually a boat ready to take you in the opposite direction. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about this morning? Right? Um, that's just you, Pastor Mike. Right? So maybe it's, let's look at the story real quick one more time, and then I want to point out something. So watch Jonah in, in verse 3. But Jonah arose to flee Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So we know he's trying to hide from God, right? He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. That's the completely opposite direction. We already said that. So he paid the fare, went down into it, to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Twice we're told what he's doing. He's getting on a boat to run from God's presence. Isn't that interesting? Isn't it interesting when you make the decision to work on your marriage and be the husband or wife that God has called you to be? It seems like a little old boat shows up. It might be, I'm not going to put a name on it. If I put a name, that might be your name, and I don't want to do that. At the office, a new secretary's hired in. And you get that off, and she pays attention to you, and she talks to you, and she oohs and awes on your jokes that you know are stupid and lame. Your wife has told you that a million times, but you don't want to listen. All right? That's me, praise God. But you go into this thing, and she's all of a sudden paying attention. And so you want to work on your marriage, but all of a sudden now you have this woman's attention. 
But really, she's just a she-devil. And she's trying to get you away. She's being used by the enemy to draw you away from God's will. Or maybe, maybe you know, we've been working on a message series the last three weeks, and we talked about, man, how God wants to bless you. And we talked about God's obedience, that if you are obedient to God, He will bless you. And, and there's areas of your finances where if you'll tithe, the Bible says God wants to bless you. And then we talked last Sunday, for many of you, we talked about the Sabbath, and that God wants to bless you if you would just rest and take the Sabbath and keep it holy. And I know that many of you that were here last Sunday, many of you online, you guys, man, you made decisions before you walked out that door, you made decisions say, I'm going to be blessed. And then all of a sudden, before you got in the parking lot, another boat showed up. And you got busy again. The boss calls, says, man, I need you, I need you Saturday, man. Could you work Saturday and I'll pay you double Double the, double the price, man, this Saturday. If you'll come in and work, and you're like, man, I need the money, and, and man, I'll do that. And, and then when you were given the opportunity to tithe, and, and you didn't do it because you're like, man, I still got that other payment. I don't know if I can trust. you know. And every, there's always a boat will show up. Maybe it's when you make the decisions to draw closer to your Heavenly Father. Maybe start attending church more frequently. To live like He said to live. A boat in Joppa will show up and it will take you as far away from his presence as you can imagine or that you can afford. See, we all have that little Jonah inside us. We all have propensity to flee his presence when things get uncomfortable. All of us in this room and online, we all have a part to play on this earth for God's kingdom. And every time that you'll make the decision to live for him, for some of you, the one decision is just saying, you know what, I'm going to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior. And there's some of you in here today, you come every Sunday. Listen to my heart this morning. This is not judgmental. Listen to me. Man, God loves you, but you're here every Sunday and you don't know him. And every time you're ready to make that decision, another little boat shows up. And takes you completely in the opposite direction. You hear the lie. See, two boats really. Somebody was talking about this. And I thought, man, you are it's right on. Because really two boats show up when God asks you to do something. You got God's boat. Get in my boat, boy. Right? And you got the enemy. Now, I'm going to tell you the truth. Many times the boat that's over here looks a lot shinier. And is a lot prettier sometimes. Than the boat that God pulls up. Then once you get into. And it's always easy to pull us away from his presence. And he wants us to run away from him. And the enemy will lie to you. He will. We'll see that here uh, shortly in just a moment as I get ready. We've got, we got a few more minutes here. See, we live in a world that is so easy to jump off the boat away from God's will and purpose. Maybe he's telling you to go into the mission field. Maybe he's telling you to serve next Sunday in Kids Nation. Maybe he wants you to grow your roots deeper on Wednesday night. Every one of us are a step away from doing something that God is calling us to do to get closer to him. But it's easy to run from God, but it's impossible to outrun him. You can't outrun him, man. John, Jonah 1, 4 says, but the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea and there was a mighty tempest on the sea so that the ship was about to be broken up. Now I want you to notice something really quick in verse four. Notice who sent the wind. It wasn't an idea. It wasn't a theory. Oh, God wouldn't do that to his children. Yes, he did. And He will. Because God will go through any door. He will go through any step necessary to get you. To get you. He loves you that much. He'll do whatever it takes to draw you back to him. And he did that. Matter of fact, in Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, it says, if my son don't despise Adonai, Adonai, that's the word Lord, Adonai's discipline or resent his reproof. Why? For Adonai corrects those he loves like a father who delights in his son. How many of y'all have children today? Come on, somebody. All right, there's something that I've discovered in my children. I know there. oh, there's one wandering around now. They're all going to look at you, son. There you go, wave at them. <laughs> we noticed something as we were raising these kids that when the brain began to malfunction, all right, let me talk to this side because they might understand this a little bit better. When their brain began to malfunction, there was a push button on the backside of them. And the warmer that backside got, the faster the correction happened in the brain. It was an amazing concept that my wife and I found. It, we, we, we whooped them. Okay, we didn't spank them. Okay, I want you to, to me all politically correct folk, we didn't spank them. No, we whoop them. Right? And they are some great, great young men. I love my boys. But I didn't do it because I hated them. I did it because I loved them. 
And that's what the Lord does to us. We don't, we don't sometimes grasp this understanding that, that God will discipline us when we choose to run in the other direction because we're on the wrong boat. We have a loving Father that will chase after us and discipline us if necessary. This is what real, Hebrews 12 even says, that He'll chasten those that He loves. God's discipline is proof that He loves us. Do you know that? I even was telling Robin today, I said, you know, if you haven't been disciplined by the Lord in a while, I would check your heart. Do you think God loved Jonah? Come on, somebody. Answer that. Yeah, absolutely. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you love your children? Do you discipline your children? God disciplines his too. We have to get that, man. It, it's, not, it's not rocket scientist, right? It doesn't rock science. Now, watch John 1, 5. Then the mariners, mariners were afraid. Now, if the boat guys that are running the boat, they're afraid you're in trouble. All right? And every man cried out to, watch this, his God threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah got down into the lowest parts of the ship and laid down and was fast asleep. Now, isn't it interesting? He's the one that's the cause of all the problems where he's at. Now, I want to fast forward here because I'm running out of time. So I want to fast forward here. There's another story similar to this of another guy in a boat during a storm. Now, we have two sets of stories here, both related. The first guy that's in the boat, Jonah, he's the cause of the storm. There's a great principle in this. I'll say it here in a minute. The other guy, the story's in the New Testament. And he was in a boat with his apostles. And when the storm rose and the wind picked up, just like here. So you have two, you have two options. You could be the cause of the storm. Or you can be with the God that calms the storm. Come on, somebody. That's truth right there, man. Some of y'all came to hear that this morning. But here's what's unique about this, and I love this truth, is this. <laughs> I'm going I'm to fast forward past verse 9. So um, go ahead and go to the who is in your boat. Thank you. Read this truth and write this down. Because who's in your boat will determine how you handle the storm. See, some of you guys in here today, you haven't done anything wrong. But your life is in chaos. Your life is in the storm. And the reason for that is because who you have allowed to be in your boat. Some of you have allowed some people in your boat that should not be in your boat. See, you can love people, but you can also set boundaries for those people. And some of you all need to do that in your life. There are people in your life that are every time you get around them, it is like drama fest. Come on, somebody. And it's okay to say, you know who the people are going to be mad about? When you set boundaries, you know who the, who's going to be mad about the boundaries? the people that you're setting boundaries for. They're the only ones going to get mad. Healthy people don't get mad about your boundaries. They're like, okay, we get it. Don't call you on Saturday. Okay, you're the preacher, whatever. Why won't you let me call you Saturday? Well, that's my day off. That's my Sabbath. Oh, you think you're better than us? No, I don't. It's just my day off. Praise God. Jonah's going to have to make some decisions here. Because see, the storm's coming against. Everybody's coming against. Like, Jonah, what's going on here? Now, Jonah has to make a decision. So will you. Is, it his, is his life worth? Is his purpose greater than the purpose of those men that are on that ship? How's that apply to me, Pastor Mike? The people that God has put in your life, you have a call, you have a purpose, you're supposed to be impacting the kingdom. Are they more important than your life? Now watch what happened. Jonah verse 10 through 12. Jonah 1, 10 through 12. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, why have you done this? He admits to them in verse 9, you can go back and read it, that, that, hey, I'm running from the presence of the Lord. For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them, verse 11, or, yeah, verse 11. Then they said to him, what shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more temp temp temptuous. And he said to them, pick me up, throw me into the sea, then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this is a great tempest is because of me. Now, man, I mean, I'm going to run through this real quick because I have to. But I want you to get this for a minute. All right? Here is what's beautiful about this. Jonah is under condemnation and guilt. And he thinks that the answer to that is just throw himself off in the sea. If you throw me out, man, I, I'll take the hit for it. And it's my fault, my fault. But here's the beauty of it. We don't have to live in that. You don't have to walk in condemnation or guilt anymore. Maybe you've ran too far from God because we have something called grace and because we have something called mercy and that if we simply turn, the Bible says as soon as we come back to the Father, He instantly loves us. Look at Romans, our final chapter, our final, final verse in Romans. 
Romans chapter 3, verse 21 through 25 says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being a witness by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus to all and on all who will believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as appropriation by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness. Because in His forbearance, in other words, in His knowledge, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. What He's saying is, so in, in, at Epic Life, we do believe in Torah. We believe in the law. But here's the thing. The law can't save you. And no matter how good of a person you think you are or how far of a person, that's what he's saying. No matter whether you're a bad person or you think you're a good person, there is no difference in Jesus. Because when you give your life to him, you experience mercy. You experience grace. And what he's asking you is, man, get out of the boat and get back on track to the life you were created to live. I need everybody to stand to their feet this morning. We got a young man here that's fixing to make that decision. I say young man. He's not really a young man. So, I mean, I mean I'm mean, not calling me young, praise God. But he's making that decision. He, made, he said, you know what? I've watched this guy's journey, and in his journey, man, has been up and down, up and down. And he's saying, enough. I want to live my life following the one that matters. And he does that by making a testament. He's being immersed today. He's being baptized today. not the baptism that saves you. You understand that, right? It's trusting in Jesus. And it's not just saying I trust him in my words. It's making my life and saying from now on my life will align to him. That's what salvation's about. Too many times we say just say this prayer and you'll be, everything will be fine. No, that's, that's a lie. It won't be. But what Jesus is asking for you, he's saying come unto me. Follow me. Get out of your boat. Go back. Every head bowed, every eye closed. What is the Lord asking you to do? I don't know what that could be. It could be anything. Maybe he's saying, today, I just want you to believe in me. I just want you to trust me with your life. Maybe for some of you, he's asking you to do something specific. Work on your marriage. Be a better husband. Be a better wife. Maybe there's an area in your life he wants you to trust him with that you've thought you could hang on to. And he says, would you give me that? Would you open that door and let me in that faith? Whatever it is, we're going to worship. And during that time of worship, in your way, I want you just to give that to him. Trust him with your life. Nothing else matters. Nothing else but trusting him with everything that he has. Will you do that today? Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for every person in the sound of my voice that, Lord, you would do a mighty work in them. And, Father, that we would have the courage and the boldness to open up areas of our life that we are running from. Lord, there's areas that you say, I want you to go here, but we're struggling. Lord, I pray that every person in the sound of my voice would see the love of Yeshua and experience that today. Even in the most rebellious person here, grace is available. But it doesn't come free. He wants your life. He wants you to trust Him. Hallelujah.